Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from Malta, the Mediterranean's tiger economy. Today we speak to Prime Minister Dr Lawrence Gonzi, the man who led these islands into Europe and paved the way for the Maltese miracle. Welcome, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Now, I, I know this, uh, this hotel has some memories for you, does it not? Ah, you'd be... Uh, the, the coincidence is something extraordinary. I got married and had my wedding reception here, uh, precisely where we are. And you know what? I probably have a photo with my wife, who is <laughs> standing <laughs> well, 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 <laughs> So I'll tell her when I go back that we've had the special privilege of having the former Prime Minister of Scotland here in the Phoenicia. Well, I'm very glad to be here to do this interview. Uh, uh, Shall we go ahead and start? Oh, sure, yes, thank you. <laughs> After you, sir. Thank you. Now, Prime Minister Gonzi, you led Malta, the smallest country in Europe, into the European Union and then into the Euro. These were big decisions. Uh, has it turned out uh, as you hoped? Yes, even better than I hoped, actually, because um, the progress that Malta has registered as a result of the, not just the EU membership, but then subsequently, immediately after, four years later, the Euro. I mean, you can see the progress that the island has made. It is the smallest island, the smallest country in the whole of the European Union, but the present rate of growth of its economy is one of the best. Uh, in 2004, when you led the country into Europe, at that stage, it was after the referendum yeah. in the political environment, it was an obvious, determined decision and with many advantages. The euro is a much more difficult decision because many of the southern European economies and the eastern European economies found the euro very challenging. Many didn't join, of course. Yes. So how much of a, a calculation was that, that the Maltese economy was ready to embrace yeah. the euro? Three points. First, all the experts except one kept giving me the advice that it would be in our best interest to join the Euro as quickly as possible. I might want to remind everybody that the 10 new member states who joined in 2004 were all obliged to join the Eurozone. There was no time determined in the agreement of accession, in the Treaty of Accession, but all 10 were obliged to join the Euro. So I took advice from my experts and everybody told me the quicker we join the better. Second thing, we had the advantage of learning from other people's mistakes. Italy is our next door neighbour. And Italy made some serious mistakes in the process of the transition from the Italian lira onto the euro. So we learned a lot from that previous experience. And thirdly, we leveraged one little advantage. Usually people consider it as a, as a disadvantage, but really small is beautiful. <laughs> you can manage more, you know the people, you can speak, you can meet, you can sense what's happening, you can react quickly, you can fix things or fine tune wherever is necessary. It turned out to be a godsend because in four years, between 2004 and 2008, we reformed the economy, we closed down um, uh, public entities that were not delivering, we took the tough decisions. Fortunately, just in time, because when the financial crisis hit us, we were strong enough to um, cope with all the challenges. Well, let, let's look first at the politics of that decision and then a bit about the economics. Politically, it seems obvious in retrospect, but in 2008, uh, as you saw, Prime Minister after Prime Minister <laughs> who joined the Eurozone yeah. falling like nine pins, mm -hmm. you coming up to an election, did you have any second thoughts? <laughs> oh, I had not just second thoughts, the third and fourth and fifth. But I did realise that it wasn't the best interest for us to go down that route. The economy needed a, a strong m measure of reform, especially in the public sector. We needed to get our national deficit down to acceptable levels, our national debt down. These are all criteria, master criteria, which you must achieve in order to join the euro. And we knew that if we don't manage to do that by our set target, which was the end of 2007, it would be a major disaster politically, imagine. But the thing that really set my mind as rest was when I went to my mother. This was just before changing from the Maltese lira into the euro. And I said, Mom, um, you know, you will now have to go and buy your loaf of bread and your daily m m milk and all that with euro. She said, I know everything. This will cost me so many cents. This will cost me so many. You know, I went back to my home. I found my wife that, you know, everything will be okay. My mom is already prepared for the transition from the euro, from the Maltese lira to the euro. And, 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 and it, honestly, it set my mind at rest. Well, because your mother and yourself had already been through a currency transition from the sterling area yes. to the lira. Oh, yes, so many years before. But yeah, true. We went through the transition. 
And that wasn't that bad. I mean, it, it was quite a smooth transition. But I was surprised this time around how smooth the whole thing went. Probably there are reasons for this. You see, Malta it has been integrated with the European market even before membership. We've been part and parcel of the European reality and European market for a long number of years. And Maltese were traveling to Europe. They knew what the euro was all about. And we knew what the disadvantages for us were with having our own currency, which was the Maltese lira, and having the euro there with the fluctuations, with the cost cost related to it, etc. So uh, it worked out well. In reality, also people felt, felt excited. So safely re-elected in 2008, then of course the, the financial crisis uh, descends on the, on the Western world. Uh, at that stage, did you think, my goodness, the economic transition which we were expecting, the small, flexible Maltese economy, but now we've got a financial crisis as well. I mean, was, he must have thought at that stage, my goodness, what can, what can happen next? Well, everything happened. We had the financial crisis, we had the Arab Spring, we had Libya up in arms, we had uh, Libya in, in itself uh, had a lot of Maltese investment over there, so that hit us twice. Everything, whatever went, could go wrong, went wrong, including, by the way, uh, this famous volcano, which I don't remember the name, it's too long to pronounce, in Iceland. In Iceland, yes. That, <laughs> that, that upset the whole uh, tourism industry. And you know Malta depends very much on tourism. And that we got all of us scared that during the peak season we would get a hit, not only by the financial crisis, not only by the Libya crisis, but also by this blessed volcano on the other side of the globe. So if anything that could go wrong went wrong. Of course, that was another transition that came with European Union membership. I mean, obviously, your predecessors as Prime Minister greatly respected. But as a European Union member, you had the, really the first opportunity as a Maltese Prime Minister to be on the world stage, to, yeah. to, to meet President Obama, yeah. the, the rest of the world leaders as a member state of the European Union. How did that renewed or increased status work oh, to the benefit of Malta? Tremendously. Tremendously. I mean, I was sitting around the table with other prime ministers with much larger countries than ours. And, and my contribution was heard just as much as the others around the table. My vote around the table counted as much as the others. And in the middle of the migration crisis, for example, in a manner which was tremendously difficult for us here, not only the political problems, but the humanitarian challenge for us. What do we do? We are an island with one of the highest population density, the highest population density in Europe, and the fifth highest, I believe, in the whole world. So you're getting an influx of migrants coming here. You've got a humanitarian tragedy. I've got people down, down here that didn't want to do anything about it with, with, with all the difficulties that it, it, it created. And we needed to raise this issue around the EU table. So we did that, we raised it, we brought over the issue of the Arab Spring and the impact of the Arab Spring and the crisis, and et cetera. And I must say, although I still argue that the results could have been much better, the value of solidarity wasn't really demonstrated in the way it should have at the time. But we were listened to, and there were solutions, and there were proposals, and there were specific initiatives that helped us out in the moment of crisis. The answer to your question is it, it changed the dimension. We were in the middle of it, which is where we wanted to be. We wanted to be around the table, make our voice heard, contribute as much as we can, and contribute in a positive way. I mean, we never looked at membership as being an opportunity for us to take, but also an opportunity for us to give. And the Mediterranean, with all the challenges that it continues to have to this very day, requires the presence of that voice around the table. Otherwise, it's the northern countries that will um, uh, impact on the major decisions that are taken. But the Mediterranean voice needs to be heard. And Malta achieved that in a major way when it joined the EU. Of course, the Arab Spring uh, led directly to the changes taking place in Libya, which had been a, a traditional ally of Malta. Uh, and you came out at a very early stage uh, saying that Colonel Gaddafi had to go, that democracy had to, to win out. That couldn't have been a, an easy decision either, given the strong economic connections between Libya and Malta. Yeah, it was a very difficult decision. We had a 40-year relationship with Libya. It, in most cases, we were criticized for that level of, of, of relationship, but people needed to understand that Libya is the closest neighbor we have, actually closer, closer to us than Tunisia, not only that. For a long number of years, Maltese business invested heavily in Libya. A lot of Maltese small businesses operated in Libya. So there were thousands of Maltese working there. It was our, in our interest to try and find a way how to live with a neighbor who had this uh, reputation, a very bad reputation in the international scene. 
But over the years, we managed and we contributed and we helped out and we come wherever we needed to come, etc. When we became members of the European Union, this role, of course, took on a, a, a different dimension. We, we were viewed by the Arab world, by Libya, but not just Libya, but Tunisia as well, as, as possible interlocutors with the rest of Europe, you know, the interface between the northern part of the African continent and the southern part of the European Union. The interlocutors, the interpreters, etc. But then when the atrocities were taking place, then we had a crucial decision. It was a, a, a difficult moment, but a crucial one. You see, we are, by our constitution, a neutral uh, state. Neutrality is a fundamental principle where there is unanimous agreement on this on the island. So we were asking ourselves, okay, what does neutrality mean? Does it mean that in the face of atrocities we just shut up? Is this, is this the Maltese identity? Where because of neutrality we hide behind our neutrality to stop condemning what is wrong? Or do we just make, notwithstanding that this will breach the relationship we have with Libya and all that and all the history and all that and putting everybody in a little bit of risky situation? I took a very strong position at the time, and I said, listen, it's either a value-based um, uh, community, it's a value-based state, it's a value-based na nation, or else we're just here just, you know, just, uh, to, to make false politics. And eventually we took the decision, and we said, no, I'm going out. I remember <laughs> the, 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 the occasion itself. I said, I'm going out there. There's the press waiting out there, and I'm going to make the statement. We condemn the atrocities that are being made, and if this is the case, then Gaddafi needs to leave. And that, that hit the headlines. Of course, a few weeks later, I was faced with two jets landing in the middle of our international oh, airport. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 but these were defectors from the Gaddafi these, regime who yes. flew over to Malta and yes. says, can we get sanctioned, yeah, please? I was at my office in Castile, I remember. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon or thereabouts. Anyway, I got this telephone call from our um, airport uh, officials there telling me, Prime Minister, we've got a problem. I mean, very unusual for somebody to phone directly the Prime Minister. Yeah. You know, and I said, two Mirage jets have just landed in our only, did our single Euro, our single airport. This is the only airport where our tourists land all the time, etc. And I, I suddenly pictured all these um, international flights landing in Malta and seeing these two Mirage jets parked in the middle of the runway. And I said, well, well, move them out of the way. And I said, no, we're not going to touch them because these uh, jet planes are armed to the teeth. And the advice we've been given by technicians that I mean if we touch anything that's wrong the whole thing could blow up. <laughs> oh my goodness today I laugh about it but at the time I remember <laughs> it's a, 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 tricky, a tricky situation. Join us after the break where former Prime Minister Dr Lawrence Gonzi speaks about the social changes which have accompanied economic success and reflects on the contribution that small countries like Malta can make to the modern world. You rejoin us at Triton Fountain, just outside the city gates of the ancient city of Valletta, and looking down on the splendid new buildings of the Valletta project. Very controversial just a few years ago, but increasingly regarded as a masterpiece of city development. We continue the story with Dr. Lawrence Gonzi. I'm interested in economic, because you successfully joined the Euro, sustained uh, Malta, recovered very quickly from the, the financial crisis. And you embarked on a, a number of fairly f ambitious uh, infrastructure projects to transform the base of the economy, but they didn't prove altogether popular. I mean, the, the Valletta project, tell us a bit about that, what, what your vision was, oh, yes. and, and, and why it wasn't, as you might think, greeted with open arms by, uh, by people. Yes, um, well, Valletta being the capital city of Malta, but just not, not just a capital city. It is a symbol in itself. Valletta was the city where the Knights of Malta, 300 years ago, placed their headquarters over there, designed by them to be a city built by gentlemen for gentlemen, is the phrase that was used at the time. But anyway, Valletta, it's a bit of history. And, and I, I remember I said, this is a symbol which needs to be upgraded. It needs to make a statement. Valletta needs to make a statement of Malta as it is today and as it should be in the future, its role in the Mediterranean, its role in Europe, its values, what it presents, etc. And the best way I could do that was to build a, an imposing building in the entrance to Valletta, which made a statement, and the building would be a new parliament. Of course, when the architect chosen was Renzo Piano, one of the most famous architects in the world, uh, and I had persuaded him, and I'm very proud of it, to come and make a design, and he presented the design, all, all hell broke loose. <laughs> all hell broke loose. Oh. 
and there was debate about the building, about the cost, about the design, about this, about that, etc. So the whole island was divided. Actually, a little bit more than divided. <laughs> but I was determined to make that statement. Um, and it had been something which everybody agreed upon at the end of the day that Valletta needed something to be, to be restructured, reformed, etc. But nobody agreed on what. And it had been a debate for so many years. Anyway, I was determined. I, 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 I did that. And today, everybody is so proud of this project <laughs> that even those who criticized it in a vicious way, Today, uh, if you go into their website, you will see their own picture with a smiling face, and the background is this blessed thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so proud of that. And in fact, one of the things which makes me really happy is I walk into Valletta. I make it a point to walk into Valletta practically every day. You know, when you started out in your political career, did you think it was possible that, that Malta would transition from where it was as effectively an imperial possession mm -hmm. uh, into a... Uh, 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 a proud and yes. equal independent state within the, the European Very country. much so, Alex. Joining the EU meant that we, for us, meant not only that we could make all this and find our place around the table where decisions are taken, but it also opened up enormous resources, financial resources, that helped us move up the level of standard of quality of life that Europe accepts as the, as, as the standard. We started off as an objective one country. We are no longer an objective one country. You know, thanks to the, also the funds that were available to us, which otherwise would not have been available to me. And did you look at any of the models of the smaller country? I mean, Luxembourg or Ireland? Uh, I mean, obviously, Malta isn't Ireland, Ireland isn't Malta, but there are some similarities oh, in sure. the transition of yes. the economy. Oh, yes, and, and, and Ireland was a model. Luxembourg was another model. We looked at Luxembourg and we realized that the success of Luxembourg, small country, population very similar to Malta's, 400,000 thereabouts, but their focus on the economy was financial services. Uh, we looked at it again, Ireland, the Irish tiger. You remember this phrase that was used at the time? And we were looking at what was the secret? How did Ireland manage to transform its economy from what was basically very much agriculture-based into a completely modern one? So we had the benefit of, having, of looking at, at, at what were the opportunities. Then decisions were taken to invest heavily in the technology and the infrastructure, in the, the use of data and, and IT as, as fundamental building blocks. In the meantime, investing in our human resources to have the right people in the right place. And there you have basically the formula of our success. So the transition into Europe, uh, which could be regarded in some ways as a, a reversion to to Malta's history, as opposed to a break with history, a break with imperial history. But if you go, if you go back, then Malta's fortunes and those of Europe, uh, as Malta as the frontier of Europe, uh, yes. uh, was actually in some ways a reversion to a more established trend. Well, the, the, there are some people who argue that the, the famous Knights of Malta, the Knights of St. John Hospitalier, they were actually um, health-oriented, um, very humanitarian kind of organization, but coming from different parts of Europe were in itself a small model of a European kind of organization, people coming from uh, different parts of Europe. In fact, if you go into Valletta and you see the different palaces, okay, let's start with the office of the prime minister. It's called Castile. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the knights from Castile, from Castilia, used to have their headquarters over there, but there was Auberge uh, de France. French ones, Auber Auberge d'Angleterre, which is the English. All the different nationalities were represented in Valletta, in these different palaces which they built and stayed over there. So in a sense, so many years later, we joined the European Union. Of course, there's a major difference between the two. One of, in, at, at the time of the Knights, later during the British Empire, we were not an independent state. We were not in control of our destiny because decisions were taken at a higher level. Around the European Union table, we are an independent state. We are there. We make our statement. We vote with the rest of, the, of, of, of our colleagues when there is shared sovereignty issues. But we are sitting there as an independent state. And I must say, the smallest member state, but respected around the table just as much as the rest were. Just a little anecdote, a little tiny anecdote related to the outgoing president of the commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. On the 1st of May of 2004, the ceremony was held in, in Dublin. And we were there uh, for this lovely ceremony. And at one point, Jean-Claude, whom I, I had not known very well, but we had got to know him there, got a glass of champagne and said, Lawrence, let's go outside and have a toast. I said, what is this guy coming up with? So we went out on the lawn and he said, I'm toasting to the fact that Luxembourg is no longer the smallest state of the <laughs> European Union, <laughs> which, is, which is true. 
And yet, small member states understand each other. We shared a lot of uh, common interests around the table. And uh, I must say, looking back, this has been such a successful experience. The economic changes, uh, which you'd hoped for, anticipated, and obviously can take great satisfaction from coming to pass, and perhaps even more successfully than people could have uh, imagined. Uh, but the entry to Europe also accompanied with social change in Maltese society. Some things you were less comfortable with, famously on divorce law reform, where you felt your conscience uh, yeah. dictated you voting against it, yeah. in a free vote, of course. Yeah. Uh, do you think that acceleration of social change in, in Maltese society is also part of the, the, the joining Europe, or do you think it's something that would have happened in the modern world anyway? Oh, I think it would have happened in any, way, in any case. I mean, today, social media uh, and all, all that has opened up any country, including Malta, to the rest of the world. So everybody, especially the younger generation, are following very closely what's happening out there, and that has become the benchmark. That has become the benchmark of quality of life, of our values, of our way of life. It's, it's, it's not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing. The European Union experience possibly um, encouraged all of this. It, it gave a context. It, it encouraged people to speak out, to, to move out of the conservative traditional module we, we, we had for a long number of years. Um, and, and in fact, I, I myself today look back and I said I, sh I should have seen the sign of the times more clearly. Even my party should have seen the sign of the times more clearly. We did not, and perhaps it's one of the failures, but you know, the benefit of hindsight is a fairy tale. <laughs> it's and again, you could draw perhaps a, a parallel with Ireland, uh, also a traditional Catholic society True. which yeah, has undergone are. some of the same social exactly. changes right. accompanying economic success. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's just, it's just it, it, takes, it takes adjustment to it. And for those who have, who have adopted uh, uh, policies that were conservative in the past, based on values that we believed in very strongly, the adjustment did not happen fast enough. Uh, in the case which I lived through because of the divorce issue, etc., uh, the, the argument I, 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 I had believed in very strongly was that the issue of divorce came out in the legislature halfway through without anybody having really put it in, in, our, in, 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 in anyone's political agenda. It was not on our agenda. It was not on the agenda of the other party either. But there was one particular MP who decided to bring it to the fore. And this was, um, uh, this was what caused the big debate. But coming back, you know, has it been a, a positive experience? On balance, yes. Divorce would have come into the island at some point in time. It had to happen. It happened in the way it did. Eventually, we had to adjust to, to it. Our society has adjusted to it in a, in a manner which I think is quite, quite good. Uh, of course, there are then the impacts, the social impact, the, uh, the, 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 the level of of, the, of changes at the family level is now totally different from what it used to be, not 100 years ago, but 10 years ago. You know, this is what we're looking at today. But again, not just more, I think this is a global phenomenon. We are living in an era where change is happening so fast, and there's no way we can stop it. We have to simply adjust and adapt very, very quickly. Now, this is where I keep telling my former colleagues in my party and also the rest of the Maltese community, you know, um, we have to maximize on the fact that we are small. We can adapt if we really put our mind to it. We can really adapt and change a challenge into an opportunity. We've done it in the past. In the social field, the challenge is enormous, and we need to adapt. I mean, today, our economy is doing extremely well. But as in other countries, the difference between those who are at the bottom of the scale and those who are at the top of the scale, how do you bridge that gap? How do you make it in a way where the, the economic benefit seeps down at the lowest levels there as well. Big challenge, not just for Malta, but for the whole... Prime Minister, have you come up with an answer to that, uh, that uh, question? <laughs> well, I have some ideas, <laughs> but I'm no longer in the chair to be able to take those ideas. But yes, there are. There are ways and means of doing this. It depends on where, you're, you're, where, you, you, where you push your priorities, really, and it depends on... This, is a this has to be a government-led initiative. This can't come from other sources. You have your, your voluntary organizations and you have your pressure groups and all that. But this is a national policy. It is the government in charge that needs to design policies that will encourage the filtering down of, 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 
of what is being generated down to the, the, to the level of where, 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 where the weakest in our society can really enjoy it. You know, at the end of the day, back to the traditional values, the common good, the value of solidarity. Where, have, where has all this gone today? And I think, you know, in a sense, we need to tap into those values, but adapt them to, what, to the realities we are facing today. My final question, really. You've spoken about <clears throat> Malta emergence uh, as an independent state, an equal state within the European Union, of what uh, Europe has allowed Malta to achieve, achieved by its own efforts, but nonetheless the canvas in which that's been achieved. What do you think small countries like Malta have to offer, not just to the European Union, but perhaps to a, a troubled world? Oh, I think so much. You see, um, the, the size itself allows us, in my opinion at least, to sense, to feel what is happening down there on the ground every day, much quicker than large countries. So th this is what I would say. I would say that um, the size or the size allows us, allows us to feel a lot more. And the small countries around that table, when they speak out, I've, I, again, I've lived this for nearly nine years, nearly 10 years around the table. When you listen to people like, the president of Cyprus, speaking about the particular situation in Cyprus, the difficulty of a divided Cyprus, and then, and, and then asking the EU to try and find and help out, etc., cetera, and, 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 and opening the eyes of the EU to say, listen, this is what was surrounding us. Your southern flank is in danger. The southern flank of Europe is in danger. I, I heard this around the table, and look at where we are today. The North African shore is all create, creation of difficulties, and the, that is the weak spot, the soft belly of the European Union, and now the EU needs, now the EU has in the past and must continue in the present and for the future to look very closely on what needs to be done to stabilize this issue. We can't continue to live with Libya in, in this present situation. That is a major source of risk for the whole of European Union. You get, you get the migration, the, the terrorists that go with them, the people who, who, who abuse of, of, of migrants and, and all that, all of them using this weak spot to enter the European Union. We need to look at this. This is the voice of the small member states around that table, you see. Well, to toast the, uh, the success of Malta as an independent, small, but equal European state, I brought along a, a Scottish quake for, for being on the show. You know the drill, whiskey in the quake, only scotch. <laughs> only scotch. And then <laughs> the toast best. your many friends. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Thank you very much. Coming up on next week's show, we discuss with top economist Stephanie Fabri the secrets of Malta's boom, with the editor-in-chief of the Times of Malta, some of the corruption allegations and environmental concerns accompanying such rapid economic growth, and ask the government chief whip, Dr Byron Camilleri MP, and the Prime Minister's special envoy to the European Parliament, Cyrus Engerer, how these issues are being dealt with as this tiny island develops its growing status as a European nation.